Good morning. And welcome here at Genesis United Methodist Church. Uh, those who are here in person, we welcome you. If you are uh, with us online, uh, we welcome you as well uh, to our worship service this morning. Thank you so much, Kim. It's wonderful to have you on organ this morning with us. And <laughs> my name is Amber Massengill, and I'm one of your co-pastors. And I know you wonder, um, what, is it going to be Amber or is it going to be Paul this week? Um, so we just, again, we like to keep you guessing, but there is a rhyme and reason to it. And some of it has to do with when the choir sings. Uh, so I'll just leave that right there. Okay. Um, we are glad uh, to have you here with us and just have a few announcements for your attention. Uh, we want to stay in touch with you, and so if you uh, are new, worshiping with us for the first time in person or even online, we want to invite you to email us at genesis at genesisumc.com so that we can get you on our mailing list and stay in touch with you. Um, we also want to let you know uh, that we are grateful for your gifts. Uh, your financial gifts, of course, that come through our online giving or our baskets in the back, um, but your gifts come in many different forms. So we want to give a special shout out today to all those adults who helped with our Youth Mission Week uh, this last week. Thank you so much. And I see some of our young people here today, and we had a great time uh, this, this last week uh, doing some service projects around Fort Worth and here at Genesis, and I hope you saw some of that on Facebook. Uh, tonight, at our Modern Worship Night, we're going to have a slideshow with some of those um, pictures uh, from the week. And want to invite you to come. Anybody is welcome, all ages and stages, to our modern worship night tonight at 6.30. Uh, we had a, a slight change in leadership. Um, uh, Thomas Mitchell is going to be coming back again uh, to lead us in worship. He led our last one, and his wife Eden is going to join us. Uh, so 6.30, if you want, you can um, bring a bagged dinner and eat it here. Uh, we will also be um, uh, having communion uh, for those who are coming tonight for communion. Uh, also, next week on Sunday, our regular worship at 10.30 will be a back-to-school blessing. Can you believe it's time for our, our kids and our teachers and staff to go back to school? Um, well, it is, and we want to bless you. We know that you are coveting prayers, you're wanting prayers, and we want to give that to you. So uh, next Sunday, we're going to have a special time uh, to bless all of those going back to school. It doesn't matter, college, um, all the way down to our preschool um, is invited to come uh, for that next week. Uh, well, I think uh, that is most of our announcements uh, for this morning. And so as we begin our worship, I want to invite um, Patricia Grasick to come up and lead us in our call to worship. Good morning. Please rise if you are able and join me in the call to worship. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. When I called you, you answered me. You have given strength to my soul. May all the earth praise you, Lord. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Praise to the Lord the Almighty, verses 1, 3, 4, and 5.
Please join me with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. As we come to uh, the time of prayer, I want to remind you that if you have a prayer request that you would like to have shared with our prayer team or in our newsletter, to email us at prayers at genesisumc.com and our prayer team will pray for that request. And if you want it confidential, you can indicate that as well. Um, but this is a, a good way for us to be the body of Christ, to support one another in those highs and lows of life. Uh, as we pray, I will say, share a short prayer, and then after each one, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and if you will please reply by saying, hear our prayers. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we do praise your name. We join with all of creation this morning as the sun rose and uh, the birds uh, sung. Lord, it was praises to you. And even when we do not speak out in praise, the scripture says, even the rocks will speak out. We praise you, O oh God, for your faithfulness. Uh, we praise you, Lord, that you are with us at all times. Lord, wanting and working for the best of us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, whom we worship today. And we thank you for this place and this time and for your church around the world um, as we uh, join in worship uh, with the Christian church today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we come to you uh, this morning and we lift up uh, the world to you. Uh, the creation, O oh God, does cry out, Lord, where there is suffering, uh, where the earth has been damaged, O oh God, Lord, where people are forgotten, silenced, Lord. We pray for all of those places around the world where the church is persecuted, where there is violence, O oh God, against uh, the least of these, especially children. Lord, we pray for those places and those people Lord, who needs you the most today, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we lift up to you um, our own nation and community. Lord, we think um, especially of uh, those who are out there all the time protecting us, Lord, serving us, uh, working for our healing and wholeness. Uh, we pray for teachers and doctors and nurses for all frontline workers and first responders. Lord God, especially uh, now as a fear and, and concern begins to rise again in our health, uh, about our health, we pray, oh God, for, for your peace, for your wisdom, uh, for our unity, uh, Lord, to prevail again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we pray for those who are sick and who are in the hospital. Lord, we pray for those who are going through treatments, those who are home um, on hospice care. Lord, receiving, um, Lord, whatever kind of care uh, is coming from their caregivers, uh, we pray for them as well. Lord, we pray for those who grieve today. Lord, who are suffering uh, from sorrow of losing a loved one and remembering those they've lost. We pray that you would wrap your arms around them, strengthen them from the inside out. We pray, O oh God, for you, the great healer, 
uh, to touch them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And finally, O oh God, we pray for ourselves and for those who are closest to us. We think of our families, those we work with and go to school with, uh, the concerns that have come on our hearts for whatever season that we are in. God, we are in different places in our journey, but you care for us all where we are. Lord, and so I pray that you would grow us as your disciples, grow us in uh, the ways that each one of us needs individually. Lord, but we pray you would also grow us together as a church. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, who does this work in us, this sanctifying grace of making us more and more like Jesus. We ask that you would forgive us and be patient with us. Lord, do not give up on us and help us never to give up on you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now, O oh God, we gather these prayers together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Robin. That song uh, will prepare us well for our scripture reading. We are going to be talking about Esther, uh, actually today and next Sunday. And I encouraged you, if you read our newsletter, that to maybe go ahead and read uh, the book of Esther in the Old Testament. It's only 10 chapters long. It's like a little short story. And um, 
Today, we're going to start with the beginning of that story, uh, which is when Esther um, is, is first kind of entering this, this time, before she is queen, um, before she's chosen by the king, um, before her real purpose is revealed, uh, Esther um, has this uh, sort of season of preparation. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, before I read our scripture, would you please join with me in our prayer for illumination? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Um, I'm going to be reading from the contemporary English version, and it just kind of reads like a story. So it's not going to be on the screen, but I just invite you to listen uh, to Esther chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. Um, at this point, uh, what has happened in the story is that the former queen, Queen Vashti, has refused to come into the king's presence when she was summoned. And so she is expelled. Uh, from the palace. It says, after a while, King Xerxes got over being angry, but he kept thinking about what Vashti had done and the law that he had written because of her, uh, which is that um, if you come into the king's presence or refuse to come into the king's presence, that you could be killed, not just expelled from the palace. It says, then the king's personal servant said, Your Majesty, a search must be made to find you some beautiful young women. You can select officers in every province to bring them to the place where you keep your wives in the capital city of Susa. Put your servant Haggai in charge of them, since that's his job, and he can see to it that they're given proper beauty treatments. And then let the young women, woman who pleases you most take Vashti's place as queen. King Xerxes liked these suggestions, and he followed them. At this time, a Jew named Mordecai was living in Susa. His father was Jer, and his grandfather Shemael, and was the son of Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. Kish was one of the people that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem when he took King Jacona of Judah to Babylon. Now Mordecai had a very beautiful cousin named Esther, whose Hebrew name was Hadassah, and he raised her as his own daughter. And after her father and mother died, when the king ordered this search for beautiful women, many were taken to the king's palace in Susa, and Esther was one of them. Haggai was put in charge of all the women, and from the first day, Esther was his favorite. He began her beauty treatments at once. He also gave her plenty of food and seven special maids from the king's palace, and they had the best rooms. Mordecai had warned Esther not to tell anyone that she was a Jew, and she obeyed him. He was anxious to see how Esther was getting along and to learn what happened to her, so each day he'd walk back and forth from the front of the court to where the women lived. The young women were given beauty treatments for a whole year. The first six months, their skin was rubbed with olive oil and myrrh, and the last six months, it was treated with perfumes and cosmetics. And then each of them spent the night alone with King Xerxes. And when a young woman went to the king, she could wear whatever clothes or jewelry she chose from the women's living quarters. And in the evening, they'd go to the king, and the following morning, she would go to the place where his wives stayed after being with them. There was a man named Shagaz, and he was in charge of the king's wives. And only the ones the king wanted and asked for by name could go back to the king. Now, Xerxes had been king for seven years when Esther's turn came to go to him during Tebeth, the tenth month of the year. Everyone liked Esther. The king's personal servant, Haggai, was in charge of the women, and Esther trusted Haggai and asked him what she ought to take with her. And Xerxes liked Esther more than any of the other women. None of them pleased him as much as she did. And right away he fell in love with her and crowned her queen in place of Vashti. 
In honor of Esther, he gave a big dinner for his leaders and officials, and then he declared a holiday everywhere in his kingdom and gave everyone expensive gifts. The end. Yeah. That's actually not the end of the story. Um, like I said, there's ten chapters, and that was chapter two. Um, but that is how Esther first comes to the palace and how she becomes queen. Uh, and it is, um, it is quite a tale. It is quite a tale. Um, as we begin uh, thinking about Esther and uh, her tale of becoming queen, um, I recognize that um, not everyone uh, can relate to, uh, to going to get th these beauty treatments and getting to choose out whatever clothing and jewelry you want and then being crowned, you know, queen. Um, some of you in here may not, may not quite relate to that part of the story, although I will say um, in, when Paul is here in a couple weeks, he's going to be talking about football. So, you know, just hold on. Um, <laughs> but I think there's a lesson actually here for all of us that we can learn from Esther, um, as not just as a young person, um, but a, and not just as a leader, um, but for any of us as disciples of Jesus Christ, we can learn from Esther and her story. Um, I actually think about the beginning of her story and all of this preparation and uh, the, the treatments that she had to go through. And it actually makes me think of the Olympics uh, that we are um, going to be, that we are watching. How many of you have been watching the Olympics? All right, I see mostly hands here. Uh, raise your hand if you're watching online. Just put a like button or something. Um, what's your favorite sport to watch? Anybody? Gymnastics, swimming, yeah? Equestrian, all right, that's neat. Um, of course, gymnastics and swimming are, tend to be the most popular in the Summer Olympics. Um, and I usually, though, don't watch the performances quite that much, but I'm drawn to the stories behind the performances, the people, their narratives, their story, like I said. Um, for instance, I don't care much about skeet shooting, but we have a gold medal winner from Benbrook. Congratulations to Vincent Hancock receiving uh, his third gold medal. Um, he practices his skeet shooting just right over here. Um, I would drive past that range um, often taking Gabe to school in the mornings. Um, well, veteran athletes to first-time Olympians, they always have these inspiring stories of their training and of their preparation and what all they have to go through to actually get to that moment, that performance that we see that lasts sometimes mere minutes. They say that they, uh, an Olympian will take four to eight years to train just to make the Olympic team, and then they have to prepare for the actual game themselves. I mean, and it's a long, arduous process that I'm sure that you're aware of, um, but just hearing some of these stories um, during the Olympics um, just inspire me. There was um, the 18-year-old Taekwondo gold medalist Anastasia Zolotik from Florida, um, who'd been dreaming of going to the Olympics since she was eight years old. Um, but then there's also the veteran ball player, David Robertson. You may not have heard of David Robertson. He spent 12 seasons in the majors, um, only to be injured in 2019 and no longer able to um, be a closing pitcher. But now he'll play for the USA in his first Olympics. Journalists call this their journey to the Olympics, and I love these stories. And as we think about Esther, I think we have to think about her journey to the palace or her journey to the crown as it is um, and what all went into it for her. She truly had her own obstacles and challenges that she had to overcome um, before she could become the queen. And for all of us, as ordinary people, we may not be Olympians, we may not be beauty queens, um, but again, I think that we all go through this kind of season of preparation uh, if we think about it. 
um, before God calls us to important tasks and to the mission of the kingdom of God. So while her years of her year of preparation getting beauty treatments might sound glamorous i do just want to kind of point out some of the challenges that were there for esther according to the story i mean first of all it wasn't exactly her choice i mean they came and collected all the beautiful women and made them go to the palace so i do want us to just kind of keep in mind that esther really didn't have a choice here nor any of these other young maidens um, second of all, um, it said uh, in some of the translations a little bit more clearly, uh, what happened that Mordecai became her guardian is that her mother and father died. And he adopted her and raised her like his own. Now, she was a young maiden, so I can only believe that her parents died when she was rather young. We don't know much about her childhood at all. But that's an obstacle that any young person, any of any age, really, has trouble overcoming, is losing both your parents. So Esther, she didn't have a choice. She was forced into the situation, really. And she had some things to overcome from her past. But there was a third obstacle for Esther, and it's that she was a Jew. And Mordecai, out of fear for her life, um, in some way or another, didn't want it to be known that she was Jewish and told her to keep it a secret. And so there was a part of her identity that she had to keep secret, that she couldn't share. And if she did share it, maybe something bad would happen to her if they knew. And yet, given all of these obstacles, Esther seems to sort of embrace the opportunity. And she seems to rise to the occasion. And she goes through these beauty treatments. Now, I know it sounds um, wonderful to go to the spa for a whole year. Um, I feel lucky if I get to go for a, an hour uh, uh, to get my nails done before a wedding. Um, but if you've ever had your skin exfoliated, waxed, or plucked, you know it's not all that fun, right? But this is what she did for a whole year um, in preparation for what was to come. Friends, uh, I think she also probably had more than just physical preparation. After all, uh, Queen Vashti had been expelled. Uh, she should have been killed. There was a new law, in fact, um, that if you didn't, uh, weren't invited into the presence um, of the king uh, and but spoke to him, you could be killed or vice versa. There was sort of a shadow over this crown, and I can't help but wonder if Esther's thinking, do I really want this? Do I really want to be chosen? Right? You and I, we have seasons of our life where we're kind of going through some, some training and some preparation, not unlike Esther, not the beauty treatments and like the spa for a year, although there could be some physical aspects uh, to, to our season of preparation. But you and I are, go through times of spiritual preparation. Uh, seasons where God is trying to get us ready for what is to come. And just like Esther, we may not know what's going to happen, and we may even wonder, do we want what's coming? <laughs> it may not even be something we ask for. There may be some fear and trepidation, some cautiousness that comes with what is, what's next. And yet... The Holy Spirit prepares us. And it's important as Christians and that we pay attention to these times of preparation because they are just as important, I feel like, sometimes, as the task that God calls us to. Parker Palmer, um, a, a Christian author and um, leader, uh, he calls this the work before the work right? 
This is the work before the work that we have to do as Christians. It can be something very simple as a youth group is going on a mission project um, or you're traveling overseas to do some service work and you get together with your group ahead of time and you meet for various meetings um, to pray together and to study scriptures and to, why are, to learn about the culture where you're going to visit. That's the work before the work, right? And if you've been on a mission trip, maybe you were a part of that kind of preparation. Yeah? Um, but it also can be very individual work um, that you have to do. Uh, going through some of that stuff from your past, like Esther. Maybe your grief. Maybe your anger. Maybe your bewilderment about what's going on. And how did you get to this place that you didn't ask to be at? Those kinds of seasons of preparation happen to us as well. they are seasons that can come unexpectedly, like when you get furloughed um, from your job at the beginning of a pandemic, and you wonder, what is the purpose of this season where I am out of work? It can also um, be a season uh, of preparation that you see coming a mile away, like when your first uh, born son gets ready in two weeks to move off to college, <laughs> and you know you're going to be an empty nester one day, very soon. <laughs> you can see that coming a mile away. So I ask myself, how am I preparing for this next season, for what's coming next? It can happen in your job, in your career, in your health, in your family life, or just in your spiritual life. And I think we can, like I said, learn from Esther. So let's take a look at the text. Uh, first, we see from Esther that she has to get clear about who she is and what she values most. Now, we're going to continue Esther's story next week, and it's going to become a lot more clear. Um, but just to give you a little bit of a preview, she has got to decide if she is going to be known as a daughter of the Jews, if she is going to let her identity be known. And she knows that this is probably going to come to a head at some point, right? Um, and she has got to get clear about that of who she is and what she stands for. And friends, our seasons of preparation as Christians uh, can often involve that too. Uh, to decide what are we going to stand for? What do we value um, as men and women of God? And what are we willing to do when God calls us to do it? Um, there was a time uh, in particular when Paul and I had a season of preparation and uh, it was really a time uh, to do many of these things that I'm going to talk about. We had been serving a church in Tampa, and you may have heard me refer to this before. Um, we were there about four years, um, but the situation was very toxic, um, and we asked for a move. And for one reason or another that I won't go into right now, it, it just wasn't working out. And so what we decided was to take a leave of absence for ministry for a year. And we joked about it being um, our, our Esther spa time. <laughs> um, and we actually moved back home to Gainesville. We moved into my late grandmother's home. Um, and we lived maybe a mile and a half or two miles from my parents. It was the first time I had lived in Gainesville for, I mean, since I left home for college. And we had two kids at that point. Uh, Michael was about two, and Gabe was kindergarten. He was five. And during that time, we didn't do a lot of paid work. We worked for the Wesley Foundation part-time, and I filled in preaching some at my home church. And we did spend that year healing emotionally and spiritually from that toxic situation. We spent that time reconnecting with my family and um, our, my home church. But really what we were doing was we were preparing for the next stage. And we took that very seriously and intentionally and prayed um, about what would come next. And the long version, or the short version of the story is at some point during that year I said, uh, God, I'll go anywhere next except Miami. Just don't send us back to Miami. And guess where God ended up sending us? 
back to Miami. And so I really needed that prayer time to become open to God and what God was going to be calling us to do. Um, again, that's all the short version of the story. But we have to get clear in these times of training and of preparation of who we are, what we stand for, and what we're willing to do when God calls us. Um, I see also from Esther's story that she leaned into her strengths. I mean, this is absolutely a story about a beautiful young woman um, and how she used that beauty, how she took advantage of um, the situation uh, that presented herself. But we, we'll see in next week's scripture readings that she just wasn't beautiful. She was also wise and cunning. And she also used those strengths. And in the season of preparation that we find ourselves in sometimes when we're out of work or we're facing a change in our health situation or our family situation, uh, those are times actually when, when we feel like we're most vulnerable and we feel like we're not enough and we're at our weakest. And yet what we need to do is lean into our strengths like Esther did. You know, maybe there is something that you've always dreamed of doing or you always knew that you were good at. And so you lean into that during those times of preparation. Not where you're trying to be somebody else. Not where you're wishing that you were somewhere else uh, in life, but embracing right where you are. Those times of preparation and, and training can be hard because they feel like holding patterns sometimes. If you've ever been in between jobs or in between relationships, you're like, okay, I'd like to hurry up and get on to the next thing, please. You know? Um, and I get that. But those are times to embrace where you are and where God has put you. Um, the last thing I think we see from Esther, and again, we'll, we'll continue to see it in her story, um, is to use our, those times of preparation, those seasons of training for prayer and fasting. Um, those are times uh, when we can hear God's voice most clearly uh, because we are seeking him most earnestly. This is like Elijah who uh, runs out into the wilderness um, list, trying to listen for God's voice, and it wasn't in the big a storm, and it wasn't in the big wind. It was that still, small voice. That is how God comes to us often in these seasons of preparation. When we don't know what is coming next, when we can't see ahead to what the future holds, all we have to do is trust in God. And they are times of spiritual growth if we are earnest and intentional about it. I often find in those times of spiritual preparation and those, those seasons uh, that God's moving me out of my comfort zone. And my comfort zone is usually about like this big, right? Maybe, maybe you would say the same. But God's work is usually happening out here well far outside of my comfort zone. And so those seasons, when I think not much is happening, God's actually moving me in small steps out of my comfort zone. And we see this with Esther, too, because first she was brought to this kind of palace, and she was with all the maidens, right? Um, like a big sleepover. But then there was another small step, and she was put into this group of concubines. And so she was slowly moving towards this place where God would have her be, which is serving as the queen. And we'll hear about that next week. So we pray and we fast so that we can, we can make those small steps also during these seasons of preparation. But prayer can also develop patience uh, that we need in these times. Um, prayer is, after all, paying attention to God's voice. Um, and, and we cannot get through these seasons without it. So friends, if any of you have ever thought, I'm not ready for this, God, or God, what is going to happen next? That I'm talking to you today, and maybe, I don't know, a couple of you, somebody who's here today, you feel like you might be in this season of preparation, this sort of holding pattern where, where maybe you, you sense God is wanting to train you and to get you ready spiritually 
emotionally, mentally, for what's coming next. I want you to know that you are in good company. Not only have I been there many times in my life, but Jesus himself was. He was sent out by the Holy Spirit into the desert for 40 days uh, to get ready for his ministry. Um, I already mentioned Elijah the prophet, who was also in the wilderness for 40 days before he confronted uh, the false prophets of Baal. The Hebrew people, they needed a little bit longer. They had to be in a season of preparation for 40 years before they reached the promised land. And honestly, when I think about it, I think maybe the disciples, the 12 disciples themselves, needed those three years of Jesus' ministry where they were hearing Jesus' teachings, they were praying with him, they were training so that they would be ready for the day when when Jesus left them and the church would be on their shoulders. So if you think, I'm not sure I'm ready for this, I don't know what's coming, what is the point of this period, the season that I'm in, you are in good company. But I urge you to be earnest and to seek the Lord during this time, to pray and to fast and get clear about who you are. And to wholeheartedly lean into your strengths and not try to be somebody else, but be who God created you to be in this time and in this place. I think that our church, actually, that Genesis is in this kind of season of preparation. Now, We might have thought that during the pandemic, when everything was shut down, that that was kind of it. Let's be honest, that was just survival, right? I think where we are now is in the season of preparation for what's coming next for our congregation. And friends, we have got to get clear about who we are as a church and what we value the most as a congregation. And we cannot try to be another church. We are not them, we are us. And what does it mean to authentically be Genesis in this time and in this place and to wholeheartedly embrace our strengths as a church? And yes, during this time, this season of preparation for whatever comes next for Genesis, we must pray and engage in other spiritual disciplines like like fasting and worshiping together and yes, Holy Communion. That these are the things that will prepare us as a people uh, for what God has next, for his mission that he has for us uh, in this place around us. So as we prepare to come to the table, I invite you to, to talk with God today about whatever kind of season that you feel like you are in. And maybe it is a season of training and of preparation. And when we come to the table, um, it is good practice for us um, because it helps us to be humble and receive whatever God has to offer. When God invites us to our table, we're not like, really, this is it? This is what you've had prepared for me? Because we know this is grace poured out for us. And it is the same when God finally gives us our mission and our task. We don't say, really, this is it? This is what you've called me to? This is what we've been preparing for. It's the grace and the love of Jesus Christ, which is poured out for all of us. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, thank you so much. Lord God, that you have called us to this place at this time. The unique persons who are all here gathered. Lord God, and for your church. Lord, in all the unique work that you have given us, we know we need to do the work before the work. And so we come to you in prayer, we come to you in worship and thanksgiving, and we come to your table asking that you would prepare us spiritually, that you would help us to hear your voice. Lord, we pray for all of those distractions, those fears, those obstacles that have have given us fear and trepidation. Lord, we pray that those would disappear and we would focus only on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, that you would help us to be faithful and dedicated uh, to the goal that you've given us. 
Lord, we pray as we come to the table, Lord, uh, that we would not trust in our own worthiness, but only trust in you. Grant us the humility to accept this grace that you have given us and the gifts that you offer us here today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The night that Jesus offered himself, he gathered with his friends at a table, and he took bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And in the same way, after supper, uh, he blessed a cup. And he said, take, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this often in remembrance of me. And so we gather uh, God's people at God's table uh, to share uh, in this meal. Would you please pray with me? Pour out your Holy Spirit, God, here on us today and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be the body of Christ in the world, your hands and your feet, Lord, doing the work of the kingdom as you have called us. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may take the cup and the bread as signs of God's love and grace for you. receive this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.